This video is sponsored by Squarespace. You can make your own beautiful website or online store with this all-in-one platform. So you're an artist and you want to get into digital art or you are into digital art, but you're looking for some helpful tips to guide you on your digital art journey. This video is for you. I've been doing digital art since like 2013 and I'm just going to talk about things that work for me, my tips, things I've learned along the way and what I would tell any beginner digital artist. So I really hope this is helpful and we're just going to jump right into it to waste no time. The first step is finding the right tablet and workflow for you. A lot of questions are like, what's the best? tablet for digital artists? What's the best tablet for beginner artists? It really depends on your budget. The first thing I'll say though, if you already have an iPad, you can check this list to see if it's compatible with the Apple Pencil. This is because Procreate and the iPad and Apple Pencil combo is my favorite way to draw digitally now. It's what I've done for the last few years. It's just so convenient and feels really, really natural. And I just love the software Procreate. If you can't afford an iPad or you don't have one and you like to use a different setup, I'll tell you what I recommend. There's basically two kinds of tablets. There are screen tablets where you draw directly on the screen and you see what you're drawing on the actual surface that you're drawing, kind of like an iPad, but it's plugged into your computer. A cheaper way to get started is to get a cheap pad tablet. If you don't know what that is, it's a drawing tablet that you have a pen, it's plugged into your computer and whatever you're doing on the tablet appears on your monitor. So you're sort of like drawing on your desk and you have to look at your monitor while you draw. I used to draw like this when I first started. I used the Intuos Pro Small because my parents got it for me for Christmas, but I wouldn't really recommend getting a Wacom tablet because they're just too expensive for what they are. I would recommend getting like a small cheap pad tablet from Huion. I feel like they're a good cost to quality ratio. I've tried a lot of their tablets and I've always been happy with them. The only thing is the drivers can be a bit finicky. What I'm trying to say here is the quality of the art you make is not determined by the tools that you use. It's up to you as the artist how you use them. Certain setups might be more convenient, but it shouldn't have a major impact on the kind of art that you make. If you can't afford your ideal setup, that doesn't mean you can't make your ideal art. I get a lot of questions about that. Do you need an iPad and Procreate to make good art? No, you don't. You can use whatever you want. Some people use mouses and MS Paint and still make nice art, but really just get whatever is within your budget range and you can work with it. Especially if you're a beginner and you're not sure if this is a path you're going to go down. If it has pressure sensitivity, then it should work for you. And if you don't know what that is, pressure sensitivity is very important for digital art. It basically makes your lines thicker when you press harder. It makes them thinner when you press lighter. If you press harder, it'll be a darker color or like more opacity. If you press lighter, it might be less opacity, so it can darken and lighten your pen strokes and make them thicker and thinner. Some pens even have tilt sensitivity. This means if you tilt your pen to the side, the brush will behave differently as well. It's kind of like turning a pencil on its side in like the real world if you want to get like a wider area to shade with. Now for a quick break to thank this video sponsor, which is Squarespace. Squarespace is an online platform where you can build your own personalized website and make it fit whatever aesthetic fits it's you or your brand the most. It can be a website with information about your business, a blog, a portfolio, or even an online store. My current website is with Squarespace and I use it mainly as a little landing page if people want to see an overview of my work, my portfolio, and where to find me. It's really easy to add images to your Squarespace site because they have automatic image scaling, so you don't need to worry about saving your images as a specific size. When you drop them into the website, they will automatically scale to fit amongst all the other images and it will look really clean and professional. I also love their portfolios and galleries feature. It's basically essential if you're going to have your portfolio online. And if you're any kind of artist, it's always useful to have an online portfolio. I also love how you can link all of your social media accounts and Squarespace makes it really easy to do this because they will automatically add the icon for the site so your customers know where to click if they want to find you on a certain social media platform. If you want to try out Squarespace for yourself, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash gelarts and you can save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. It really helps out my channel and onto the rest of the video. Now let's talk about software. Which drawing program should you use? I used to use Paint Tool Sci religiously for all my digital art, but if you're going to be doing art on your computer, I would probably recommend Clip Studio Paint nowadays. So when I recorded this part about Clip Studio Paint, I didn't realize that they had announced like back in August that they're changing to like a subscription 
based thing, which is honestly pretty disappointing because they were the one drawing software that didn't have a subscription plan that was like a really good drawing software and it wasn't that expensive. So like if you currently own Clip Studio Paint as like a perpetual license, you have to pay if you want to get any updates and I think they might eventually stop supporting it. Um, and you have to like buy like a yearly update pass to get updates. So that's basically a year subscription. It's still a lot cheaper than Photoshop and like Adobe stuff, but that's just something to keep in mind. This is if you're not going to be using an iPad in Procreate, which is my top choice, but I realize that's expensive and not accessible to everyone. So I would recommend Clip Studio Paint. You can try it out for free for three months to see if you like it. Um, I think it says like it's a 99 cents a month for three months. But you have to like download the app to get the deal, something like that. That's what I did. The reason why I recommend Clip Studio Paint instead of Paint Tools Sai is that I always found it kind of difficult to get custom brushes in Sai. But now that I use tons of texture in my digital art, I used to not use a lot of texture. I used to be very like, I wanted like clean lines and clean shading and I wanted to like make everything smooth. But now I use so much texture, I just can't really use Psy anymore. So Clip Studio Paint is a lot easier because it's so easy to get custom brushes. There's like a whole community of people who share their brushes, a lot of free brushes. You can pay for some brushes if you want, but there are a lot of free brushes and it comes with some pretty nice brushes. So Clip Studio Paint is great because of the brushes. I haven't really used any other drawing program besides Paint Tool Sci, Clip Studio Paint, and Procreate. So that's where I'm coming from. Someone also asked me about lower requirement software. And I think Paint Tool Sci runs pretty well on slower computers. I always found it booted up really quick and it didn't take too many resources from your computer. I think just compared to other programs I've used, I think it's a little more lightweight. I have some really old paint tool side tutorials if you want to check those out, but I probably won't be making new ones. So those are my um, my outdated paint tool side tutorials. There's also a lot of free drawing softwares out there. I haven't used any of them personally, but I can put a list of them in the description if you want to like check out any of those. And I'm sure there's tons of resources for learning them. The next tip is get to know your keyboard shortcuts. I feel like this is mandatory if you're going to be doing digital art. You want to know your basic gestures or keyboard shortcuts that will speed up your process and not get in the way of you actually drawing. The ones that I use all the time are brush up and brush down, which are the brackets. Sometimes it can be plus or minus, but sometimes that's zoom in, zoom out. It depends on what program you're using, but I use the brush up, brush down shortcut. You can hold down space to move the canvas around. I like to attach one of the button pens to the eyedropper tool. Undo is control Z. Save, Control S, deselect, Control D. You can use Control T to open up a transform box, which basically lets you like move parts of your drawing around after you've selected them. B for brush, E for eraser tool. There's lots of other keyboard shortcuts that you might personally use more than me. And Procreate works with gestures and you'd probably want to just watch like a Procreate tutorial on how to use all the gestures to draw like double tap is undo. Um, three finger swipe. I can't even remember what that is now because it's so like ingrained in my muscle memory, but make sure you learn those. It'll really help you out. Now let's talk about canvas size. I think this is something that a lot of beginners ask about as well. Basically, there's two things you're going to look at, the dimensions and the units that you're using and the resolution. The resolution is usually in DPI and I like to always keep my resolution at least at 300 DPI. The dimensions for your canvas should be as big as you can, but you don't need to go overboard. It really depends on what you're going to be using it for, but at least go into the thousands of pixels when making a canvas. I like to go by inches because I can kind of visualize it better and work a bit larger than you need. So if you need a four by four inch drawing for whatever reason, you might want to make it eight by eight inches or like six by six, make it a little bit bigger. This gives you a lot more wiggle room for what you can actually use your art for in the future. So if you can make it a little bit bigger, that's usually better. As long as your program can handle it, because the bigger you make your canvas, the slower your computer will get because it's using more resources to like process that giant canvas. But I always work in 300 DPI. That's like my standard because that is the standard print quality. So if you ever want to print it out, 300 DPI is great. You can go higher if you want. It's never going to hurt to go a bit higher. The only thing that it changes is that the size of your canvas will also impact how your brushes look since brushes don't scale to fit your canvas. So like a 20 
pixel brush, like a size 20 brush, will look huge on a small canvas, but it will look small on a big canvas. So that means your brush textures might look smaller or larger depending on your canvas size, just like real brushes and canvases. If you have a big canvas, your little brushes that you love the texture of, um, it might be harder to find a bigger brush with that same texture resolution, but this shouldn't be that big of an issue if you're not going like, you know, like 30 by 30 inches. That's just something that I found when I do digital art, when I make a huge canvas, my brush textures like look a little bit smaller because the canvas is so big. It's just something to keep in mind. It's not that big of a deal. I also want to talk about brushes and textures. In my old digital art videos, you will hear me say things like, you don't need any fancy brushes. You can use the basic brushes that come with the program. And this is true, it really depends on what you want your art to look like, but in the last several years, especially through art school, I have fully embraced having very textured brushes and I'm trying to incorporate it into my work more and more. I think textures and brushes with texture can really make your art have a lot more personality and this can make your art feel less digital and feel more natural. And I think if you're a beginner artist and you're struggling with your digital art feeling a little bit too like, a little bit too, what's the word, like artificial looking, um, not very natural, having more textured brushes can help. It depends on the style you want though because some people have really sleek like cell shaded styles, but if you're looking for something more naturalistic, having brushes with texture can work really well for you and I'm gonna link all of my favorite brushes in the description. I get so many questions about what brushes I use like in every single video I post I get a question about the brushes that I use. I'm gonna put a big list in the description of my current favorite ones as of making this video. These will be Procreate brushes and also I'll put one Clip Studio paint brush pack that I like. Just a warning, they're all paid brushes. You can also make your own brushes, but if you're a beginner artist, you don't need to worry about making your own brushes yet, but you definitely can if you want to jump into that. It's really easy to do on Procreate. I don't know how to do it on like Clip Studio paint and stuff. So basically the brushes and textures thing is something you have to discover for yourself. As you go with digital art, I think it's a good idea to try to find brushes and textures that only you use. And I haven't done this because I use other brush packs, but I think it would be nice to make a couple of brushes that are my own texture that nobody else has, just to make your art a little bit more, a little bit more like stand out from the crowd kind of thing, because now that Procreate is so popular, you can kind of tell when an art piece has been made in that software because the default brushes have a certain look to them. And if if you also use Procreate, you can easily identify like, oh, this person used the 6B pencil brush from Procreate. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just if you want your art to have a certain like special touch to it, that's like only something that can come from you. It might be nice to make your own brushes. And I really want to make my own brushes. I might make a video about this of me trying to make my own brushes. I actually do have a few brushes that I've made. Um, I made them in school because it was an assignment, but I haven't made any since then. That's just some food for thought. You really don't have to worry about that too much because your color choices and the way you draw will always be like an original thing about your art because no two artists draw the same way. The brushes and textures are just kind of like the cherry on top. My next tip is a quick one, name your layers, but do as I say, not as I do, because I I try to name my layers, but nine times out of 10, I don't. I just, I, I, I go too fast. I can't be bothered. But if you can get into this habit early on, it might save you some stress later on. So since we're talking about layers, we can talk a little bit more about layers. You'll have some basic controls for your layer panels. There'll be a new layer button, a delete layer button. You can also merge your layers together. You can put them in groups, in folders. I find using folders really helpful. You can flatten your image. This means you merge all your layers together and everything becomes one layer. I don't really use this that often because I don't like to flatten my painting because I need access to my layers, but a lot of people will have a sketch layer, a line art layer, a coloring layer, and maybe some layers on top for some highlights and details. There might be a background layer and basically whatever layer is on top will show on top of everything else and everything below it will be beneath it. That's like the basics of layers if you don't know how they work. Something that is a really great tool that I use all the time is alpha lock, which is where you lock the transparency of your layer. This means you can paint directly on that layer and it won't go outside of what has already been drawn on that layer. So this is how people change their line art color or change a certain color in their drawing and you can paint over it so you can change parts of it to like say you want your line art to be a very dark brown. You can make some parts of it darker, some parts of it lighter, paint on it. That lock transparency is a really, really helpful way to make adjustments to your layer without painting outside of what's already been put on the layer. I use it every single time I, I do digital art. There are two kinds of locks though. There's the alpha lock or like the transparency lock, 
but you can also lock the entire layer from being edited at all. This is if you want to preserve something. So say you're done your sketch layer, you lower the opacity of your sketch layer so that it's lighter. You want to do some line art on top of it. You can lock your sketch layer so that you don't accidentally put your line art on top, make a new layer, do your line art there. And then you can always unlock layers afterwards, but you have to like click the actual unlock button. This can kind of save you in the future. Um, I, I lock layers all the time. There's also clipping masks. People asked me about clipping masks a lot and I think they're just like such a helpful thing. And this is how people will color on top of their base colors. I use clipping masks every single time I do digital art. So basically how they work is you have your base color. Say I drew a dog, I colored in the dog on a layer below the line art. Then I make a layer above that because I want to do some shading on the dog. You basically, it depends on what program you're using, but you turn that layer into a clipping mask and then basically that means it is attached to the layer below it and whatever you draw above that layer in your clipping mask layer will only show up on the layer below it and if you uncheck the clipping mask it will reveal the entire layer but when you recheck clipping mask it will clip to whatever is below it and it's a way to kind of keep all your shading contained into your base colors it's a great tool and i got a lot of questions about clipping masks so i hope this helps i got a lot of tips about choosing color i feel like this is more of like a general art type of question, but I do recognize that coloring can be a really huge challenge when you first start digital art. It definitely was for me. I would spend hours on one like section of hair only to redo it over and over again. I have a few general coloring tips that might help, but overall practicing a lot will get you to where you need to be. But I know that tip videos can kind of give you that jump start. So don't give up. Make sure you take breaks when you need to. I got so frustrated when I first started digital coloring or like digital art. I would get really, really fed up when I was trying to learn, but I would always take a break and come back to it and try again. Nothing could stop me from, from learning digital art. So I think the biggest obstacle to digital coloring is the seemingly endless options for color. You have every single color at your disposal and this is a good thing and a bad thing. You really want to limit yourself and not go too crazy with the colors or it's hard to, it becomes hard to control and it can start to look muddy. Like if you're going to be painting, you don't buy every single color of paint tube available and squeeze them all out on your palette and then use them all in your piece. You usually only use like a small collection of colors and mix them together. So this is something you can actually do digitally and this is how I make my digital artwork. I will start by laying my colors down with a soft brush, maybe like a soft texture brush, something that becomes darker or lighter if I press harder or softer. And I don't use too many colors. I start with a basic color palette and I let the colors blend together and have this sort of like watery, hazy sort of like base color. And then I'll color drop from that and paint in other areas and make sure everything stays unified and not go to the color wheel too often. The color wheel is useful for grabbing new colors to add, but you don't need to use the color wheel for like every single color you lay on your canvas. It's really helpful to eye drop from what you've already done and this just makes things look, this just makes your palette more harmonious and it's less overwhelming. I think a good color theory tip in general is limiting yourself. It's easier to do this in traditional art, but it's more difficult to do this digitally because you just have so many options and just exercising restraint I think can be really helpful. Something that helps me a lot too, if your drawing is looking a little bit bland, you're not really sure why, a good thing to do is to check your levels and your levels are your range of darks to lights. So if you put your drawing into a grayscale, does it still look like nice? Does it does it pop or is it missing contrast? The way you can easily do this is add a layer on top of everything and set your blending mode to color. These are all the modes that can change the appearance of the layer based on what's below it. Set to normal by default, but you can drop down that window, set it to color and fill the canvas with a neutral color, like a gray or, or black or something. And then you can see what your drawing looks like as a grayscale below, and you can flick this on and off. This can help you see if you need some more contrast because when you're working on one drawing for so long, you might not notice if there's a contrast issue. It's just you're staring at the screen, you're painting, you're focusing. Um, it's hard to see it with like a fresh set of eyes. So putting that gray blending mode on the mode color to see how your values are looking can be a great way to easily see if you need to add lighter lights or darker darks. Or you can export your drawing as a JPEG and take it into an image editor and decrease the saturation. That's 
that's essentially what you're doing here. You can also scan your traditional art and paint over it digitally. I think this can actually help you learn digital art a little bit better. Um, it can give you ideas on how to make your digital art look more natural and where on the color wheel certain colors actually exist because once you put them on your canvas, they might look a little bit different because whenever I paint over my traditional stuff digitally, I will like eye drop from the scan and use those colors in the painting. So if you like the way your traditional art colors are, bringing them digitally and working on them digitally might be a helpful thing to do. And it's also really fun to merge the two mediums together and I actually do this a lot. Another question I got was blending modes. I love blending modes. I use them all the time. The most important important thing is to not overdo it because if you put too many blending modes on top of each other, you might start to get an artificial looking over filtered type of drawing. But basically what they are is you can change the blending mode of any layer and whatever is in that layer will appear differently depending on whatever is below it. It's sort of like a mathematical thing that the software does to determine what the output is. And you can read about this and how the software's kind of come up with the result, but I think it's more useful to experiment with them yourself, but I'll tell you about the ones that I use most often and why. Normal is the regular blending mode. It just shows what's in the layer. Overlay, I will use this to add warm glows or lighten the piece while keeping some saturation. I usually use a light yellow, orange, or red, but you can experiment with different darknesses, colors, saturations to see what's right for the piece. I will basically will just make a new layer on top of everything, get a nice big like airbrush, put down some light yellows, set the blending mode to overlay and reduce the opacity. A lot of these blending modes you'll probably want to reduce the opacity. You don't want them at full strength most of the time because it can be a little harsh. You can actually reduce the opacity of your entire layer and that's what I do when I use blending modes. Another one is multiply which a lot of people use for shading. I like to do darker saturated blues and purples depending on what the color of the objects are that I'm shading. It's a good way to shade an entire, like, if you want to, like, apply a shadow to your entire piece, it's, like, a good quick way to do it. But it's good to not overuse multiply. I think it's also good to know how to shade your artwork yourself without multiply because this can just make it easier to achieve the colors that you want because the multiply layer takes whatever color you shaded with and applies it to whatever is below and it makes everything lean more towards that color that you chose. It's just good to not use these as too much of a crutch. I like to do a combination of the two. I'll use some multiply when I need it. I'll add in my own dark colors when I need it. And usually after I do these like overlays and multiplies, I'll paint over the piece anyway to just make it look a little more natural. And you can't tell that I just like, you know, slapped a multiply layer on or slapped an overlay on. Um, I like to blend them in afterwards. I use screen a lot. I find this is good if you want to add some haze or fog to lighten areas, but not really in like a really saturated way. It's a more like subtle way. I experiment with a lot of other blending modes as I go. If I want to lighten certain parts of my piece, darken certain areas, whatever looks the best in that scenario is the one I'll go with. You can look up definitions of all the blending modes, but I think it's more helpful to experiment as you work and see what you like to use. And it's important to not overdo it. These are helpful for some subtle changes, but if you lay blending modes over each other over and over, it might start to make your piece look too artificial if you aren't as experienced with them yet. I also want to talk about masks. I think this is a slightly more advanced topic, but it's also can be really useful because I, I think they're a lot easier to use than people think because I thought they were really confusing, but once I understood them, I was like, oh, this is actually a really useful and easy concept. So masks are helpful if you want to not do destructive editing. And what destructive editing means is you it means you're modifying an original image instead of applying a change to it that you can easily undo and redo, if that makes sense. So say you have a piece of your sketch that you really like, but you want to try a different outfit or hairstyle. You can erase the current outfit, draw a new one, but then you lose the old outfit. Or you can duplicate it, hide the old one, draw a new outfit. This works too, or you can use layer masks to temporarily hide parts of any layer. You have to click on the white box of the mask to be able to edit the mask itself. Masks will show anything in that layer that is appearing as white in the mask. It will erase anything that's black and any gray values will show an opacity depending on how light or dark the gray value is. You can do this in any basic drawing software, I'm pretty sure. And once you figure out how easy it is, I think it can change the way you edit your drawings. 
And you can also toggle the masks on and off um, and you can delete masks completely and it will reveal the entire layer again. It's like a temporary way to hide parts of your layers. I think this can be a pretty useful thing, but you don't have to worry about masks if you don't want to right away. It's just something that I wanted to mention. If you want to have references while you're drawing digitally on your PC, I would recommend to use Pure Ref. And for your iPad, you can use VizRef. Basically, this allows you to have a collection of references that you can zoom in and out on. You can save files and canvases of different reference collections and have them sort of floating on your screen as you work. Another quick tip is you can actually flip your canvas while you draw and this lets you see mistakes as you're working. Um, it's kind of like a common meme nowadays where like you're drawing and everything seems fine and then you flip the canvas and it's like a jump scare because of how like wonky it looks flipped around. So I think it's pretty helpful to like flip your canvas every once in a while to see if things look a little wonky. It essentially lets you see your piece with a fresh set of eyes and you can fix any mistakes that you might not notice, but other people might notice. I really hope this video helps. It is a lot longer than I thought it would be, but I just have a lot to say about digital art and I feel like I can't even like come close to covering everything in a small YouTube video. So if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about, I could do a part two to this one. I have a lot of old tutorials and old tips and tricks videos that I made like many, many years ago. And I've learned a lot more since then and my opinions on things have changed and I might not agree with some of the stuff I said in the past about certain like techniques or ways that I draw. Just a lot has changed since then. So I wanna like reapproach a lot of those topics and remake them in my current experience level, I guess. And feel free to comment anything you might be still confused about. I'm sure um, myself or another commenter might be able to assist you. I always like seeing when my comment sections are full of like people helping each other. I think it's pretty wholesome because I obviously can't get to every single comment all the time. There's also tons of online resources that can help you, but I think it's also important to not look at too many tutorials over and over because you can get really overwhelmed and like overstimulated with all of these ideas and tips and you and then you get you start to overthink everything. I think it's good to just keep practicing, keep drawing, don't give up because it is weird to go from traditional to digital. It can feel really strange and foreign, but if you put the work in, it can become just like a really wonderful way to make art and I hope this helps you get to that point even just a little bit. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for submitting questions on Instagram about what I should include in this video and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.